Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Susan Santone. I'm a board member on the US Society for Ecological Economics. And today I've got the great pleasure of introducing one of the pioneers in the field, Richard Norgard. Um, Richard, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. I'm an economist by training, not by conviction. I studied economics as an environmentalist and went into economics because I thought economics was the problem, not the solution. So I wasn't studying to join the, the priesthood. I was more of an ethnographer, but I happened to end, end up at the University of Chicago getting my PhD uh, in the late 60s. And this is before Chicago economics took over. Uh, it was the outside group, uh, but I took courses from Milton Friedman and oh, T.W. Wow. Schultz and Arnold Harberger and all the famous Chicago economists that, um, you know, they they were, you know, they were impressive at the time, but they they weren't Nobel laureates yet. They weren't <laughs> uh, they weren't on television um, preaching free markets yet. Mm -hmm. um, it was still a, a much smaller operation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I I learned the the lingo well. The I didn't have to believe it, so I didn't question it. I just learned what they were doing and learned how to follow that same logic. Mm -hmm. um, came to Berkeley as an agricultural economist, because that's where environmental economists were placed, mm -hmm. and studied pesticide use and the economics of pesticide use and biological control, and but continued to do what my PhD dissertation was on, which was petroleum and petroleum scarcity. I mm -hmm. uh, spent some time up in Alaska with um, Prudhoe Bay Field, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline controversy, and kind of just did all kinds of different things. And mm -hmm. I got tenure early, but the uh, chairman, chairman of my department said, well, you really need to specialize, Professor Norgard. You can't do all these things. You can't, you can't do water economics and petroleum economics and pesticides. And um, I kind of said, oh, yeah, sure. And <laughs> two years later, I was off in Brazil studying development and environment. And that was transformative because I was in a different ecosystem and a different mm -hmm. cultural system. Mm -hmm. And it really brought forth that the economy we have is is something we created because the Brazilian economy was their their creation and that was you know really instructive to realize that oh the economy isn't just there it's you know it's unique to our culture it's a part of our culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so that brought me into environment and development and sustainable development before the name had been attached to it but i also spent a lot of time in the amazon and learned about tropical leaf tropical, tropical rainforest uh biodiversity and that put me on all kinds of early committees of the national academy of sciences so i spent a lot of my career learning um sort of ahead of the game just just a little before others, I would jump into something and then serve on these National Academy committees about these different things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and learn to be a team scientist through that process. Um, and then the 1990s, I got back into sort of neoclassical economics, studying um, climate change, early climate change. Mm -hmm. Uh, working with Richard Howarth, who was the editor of the Ecological Economics Journal for 20 years or so. Um, but Richard was a graduate student of mine. He built overlapping generations models. And we showed that if you give future generations rights to resources, to something like climate, then you can have an efficient economy that's a very different economy than what you get with these um, infinitely lived individual models that, mm -hmm. that are so common in economics. But we also showed that 
climate change is an equity issue. It's a matter of the rights of future generations. It's not an efficiency issue. It's always good to be efficient, but um, to solve the climate issue, you have to worry about equity. Right. And for a while, that was very popular, a big splash in economics. And and then people realized that, oh, economics doesn't have the answer. It, it has to be joined with moral, uh, the moral decision to protect future generations. And, and then this idea of energy, overlapping generations uh, sort of got pushed out of economics rather quickly. Mm -hmm. So it, that was an experience of, you know, doing better economics and then finding the profession didn't want it. And so part of the book is this sort of explanation is how did we get to this point where, you know, you can do economics as the economists do economics and then have the profession say, no, that's not the answer we want. Uh, we're supposed to say what's the right thing to do, not say if we want this, then that. Mm -hmm. um, that was, yeah, revelatory. Well, that's a good segue um, to introduce your book. Would you mind uh, telling us the title? And uh, I guess you told us a little bit about what inspired you, but maybe what particularly at this time made you want to pull all of that together? Um, yeah, I, I, the book started as trying to explain the economist's reaction to my career. Oh, okay. So the later chapters of the book take these things up about resource scarcity, about intergenerational equity, mm -hmm. um, about a lot of economics that is bad economics on their own terms. Mm -hmm. and, and I began to realize that economics is, is a belief system and the economics profession is caught up in this belief system it helps perpetrate the belief system, mm -hmm. but it's a belief system that has arisen and co-evolved with, become syncretic with uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, we have prosperity gospel was the fastest growing part of Christianity for 20 years. And, and that's because we needed these, people needed an explanation of the world they live in. And so the book is titled American Economism. Economist mm -hmm. is this belief system. Mm -hmm. And working with economism is what I call the Econocene. Mm -hmm. And it's the equivalent to the Anthropocene, but the Anthropocene is way too, too big and too vague. It's, people have been around for 300,000 years. Um, it wasn't until the last 200 years that we really had a major impact on the environment. And that was a combination of technology and adoption of the market system. Mm -hmm. And while the book really acknowledges the importance of technology and the way science is all fragmented, um, issues, problems were accelerated by the market system. And so it's really this coevolution of beliefs that economists are helping bring out and then the Econocene is the cosmos in which we live mm -hmm. it's the environment people know so you know in the bible there's shepherds and their sheep and the starry sky in the reality in which most people live there's towering skyscrapers there's mm -hmm. um you know we're living in the artifacts of the economy, not nature. Well, that's great. I mean, not the great that we're doing that, but uh, you know, what a great explanation and sort of setting the stage for this interview. Um, you know, I read the first three chapters and I really enjoyed them. And you talk a lot about sort of the myths and narratives um, that make up this uh, way of thinking. Can you explain some of those myths and narratives and how they differ from some of the you know, traditional, more traditional ways of thinking based on interdependence and more uh, humans as being part of the environment rather than separate from and above it. Yeah. So 
of our 300,000 years of being homo sapiens, um, we were very, living very integrally with the environment. Every, you know, the men were hunting and gathering, and the women were, the women were gathering. They uh, were very interactive. Everybody was interactive. Each person had knowledge of nature, mm -hmm. and they shared that knowledge. And they learned to fight together, to hunt together, to uh, share knowledge together. And so the whole provisioning process was interactive with nature very mm -hmm. directly. But it was also a moral process that you hunted better if you could depend on what your fellow hunters were going to right. do if this happened to you and what you were supposed to do if something were happening to them. And so there were moral expectations that built up, mm -hmm. but there were also moral expectations that everybody would share everything. Mm -hmm. That the hunters who were successful one day just wouldn't hold on to it. They, they killed and not share it with others. And so provisioning was both knowledge of of nature and the moral expectations of how people share mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that moral realm realm and reality realm are all together and they get built into stories mm -hmm. and myths that then get carried on from generation to generation but they're pretty much commonly held amongst the people mm -hmm. and you compare that with today Today, we all live very specialized lives. We have mm -hmm. special knowledge that we can apply. Science is all fragmented. Uh, morality is left to the church. Mm -hmm. And you know, scientists try desperately not to say what should be done. But of course, scientists are always saying what should be done. And then economics is in this special place where it tries to be a science. But it's really about what should we do? Mm -hmm. So it's about a moral issue. Of course, it comes out of moral philosophy mm -hmm. and then thinks it's transitioned into a science. And yet it's about what should we do? Mm -hmm. It's about what is out there in reality. Um, and so economics is in this very special place of you know, trying to reach to moral issues and trying to say how the world is and then this is what we should do, but it's a science, mm -hmm. which is not possible. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about some of the historical events that you think most influence sort of this shift in way of thinking? Um, you know, you talk in the book about sort of, you know, the narratives around, you know, the market will solve our problems, the, you know, individualism is the way to go. You tie that closely um, with religious, re religion and moral thought. Can you share a little bit about some of the historical events you think could have led to that way of thinking? Well, economics comes out of natural theology. Um, natural theology was the study of the creation. It was a way of trying to understand the creator and what people should do by studying nature. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was not just a curiosity about nature. It was really a pursuit of trying to find moral truths as well as the nature of, of, of the creation. And as an effort to find moral truths, they were also trying to say what people should do. Um, Adam Smith was a natural theologian. He actually believed that God created the social system we have. Mm -hmm. When we study what we think is Adam Smith, we know that he refers to the market coming to equilibrium as if by an invisible hand. Right. But in fact, Adam Smith didn't say as if. Mm -hmm. Adam Smith said the market works by an invisible hand. And that's God. So that separation of sort of God and knowledge pervades science into the 19th century. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. really until Darwin. Mm -hmm. If you get science where the science is not referring to the creator and the creation, but Darwin and Wallace come up with this 
vision of natural processes without a creator. Mm-hmm. And so the transition is late, but in the natural, the social sciences, the transition is even later. So I have a book written in 1921 about the evidence of God in American history, in America's history, mm-hmm. written by a person who had been a University of Pennsylvania professor. Um, he wasn't at the time he wrote the book in 1921. Um, but the mixture of what should we do and how do we interpret what's going on is carried through. And one of the central arguments of this book is that while economists say they are scientifically studying the economy, it's their stories that have power. It's the narratives they tell. Mm-hmm. It's the stories that, that Milton Friedman and Rose Friedman, when they went on television in the 1970s and explained how wonderful the free market was, they weren't giving the coefficients and of their equations and the R squares of their estimation and the, um, you know, they weren't talking about their wonderful mathematical models. They were giving stories. Yeah. Stories that are powerful. Mm -hmm. And the story that the free market works is, you know, what has been believed for the last 50 years or became increasingly believed and, you know, in the last decades have come into question a bit, but, yeah, you, you talk about um, Bretton Woods um, and after that period when this way of thinking really spread. Can you say a little bit about that? And Well, yeah, because the book, I can't talk about all economists, economisms in all the world. So, so the book is concentrating on American economism. Mm-hmm. But, you know, America becomes a world power after World War II. Financially, the dollar becomes the the main currency. Bretton Woods sets everything up as a world system, a global system of finance. And then the World Bank is created to save, to reconstruct Europe, and then it Mm -hmm. gets into the development game right after that. Um, And America is the dominant power militarily and financially, but it's also ideologically in a war with the Soviet Union and and to a smaller extent in the 50s and 60s with China. But ideologically, it was the capitalists, they would refer to the market economy versus the godless Soviet (laughs) people, the godless economy of the socialist Soviet, you know, United States. Soviet Socialist Republic or States of the Republic. I can't remember, don't remember the USSR anymore. But um, the American economy was godly. Mm-hmm. Billy Graham was preaching, you know, to the whole American people. He gets invited to prayer breakfast with the American presidents. Um, Congress has prayer breakfast. We have in God we trust printed on our mm-hmm. currency and under God in our um, Pledge of Allegiance. All this stuff comes in after World War II. And, and economics as a profession is all involved in this. And the Chicago School really picks up on it. And while we've been a mixed economy coming out of the war and through the 50s and 60s, the Chicago School preaches free market mm-hmm. and against government. Mm-hmm. And it's that, it's that preaching, it's not the mathematical models that are powerful. Mm-hmm. So you also talk a little bit at the beginning around about how economists have often been at the sidelines of climate change, which, you know, as you know, it is an existential threat. How do you think these views and myths of um, economism keep economists at the sidelines? Well, I was actually sponsored at the University of Chicago by T.W. Schultz, who in 1951 wrote an article 
about how land is becoming less and less and less important in the American economy. And this was sort of at the beginning of, of national income accounting. Mm -hmm. He gets the numbers as best he can and says, oh, isn't this interesting? Land is, rents from land are just not as important as they used to be. And the profession as a whole picks that up. The, um, the two books, one by Denison, one I'm forgetting right now, but on the sources of American economic growth, analyses of how the economy had grown don't even include land, even mm -hmm. though, you know, Malthus emphasizes land, Ricardo emphasizes land. Land is in the beginning of the economics, um, absolutely central. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely essential. The physiocrats is based on land. Mm -hmm. And and all of this disappears. And I, you know, I don't know how it can disappear except that there's this tremendous will for simplification mm -hmm. and to not have to bother with land. Um, there was another really important thing was the resources for the future put out a book called Scarcity and Growth. Mm -hmm. And that also showed that the amount of land and capital used to extract oil, to mine iron ore, to farm land was declining. And not only just a little bit, but just dramatically declining. Mm -hmm. So that we could just get resources easier and easier and easier. Mm -hmm. It must not be scarce. And so we just don't need to worry about it. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, be, it's just not an economic problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know how it's just crazy how can you be so detached from the reality we live in yeah. <laughs> uh, but do you, do you see that continuing today um, oh yeah I mean so yeah Brad DeLong just came out with a book called Slouching Towards Utopia Oh, wow. and it's, it's, a, it's a history of economic growth, mm -hmm. uh, mostly emphasizing the United States, but many things global. And it's all about economic growth, economic growth, but nothing about, you know, he doesn't even get into climate change. Right. So here we are, you know, as we understand it, as climate scientists understand it, as the majority of the science community now understands it, as you say, in an existential threat. Mm -hmm. And we have major Nobel laureate economists writing as if it doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. yeah. And William Nordhaus, when he gave his Nobel laureate lecture, said, please join me. You know, this is a rich area for economists to work in. Mm -hmm. and it's just economists weren't trained that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you think that, you know, there's the degrowth movement, steady state. Do you think that they have the power to, you know, shape new narratives uh, that could pierce through this idea of, you know, unlimited growth is both desirable and possible? I think... You know, I think we're beginning to see mm -hmm. some breaking through. We're beginning to see The Economist magazine taking these things up. They may be mm -hmm. referring to it as a little bit crazy still, but they're raising those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, we're beginning to see Herman Daly interviewed and, you know, placed at a higher level than he ever was before, finally. So can you talk a little bit about um, the role of private property and land ownership and in, in shaping these narratives? Yeah, well, one of the one of the biggest problems we have is in the Western mind, and it starts back in the Renaissance, but becomes more solidified during the Enlightenment with the writings of John Locke, is the justification and rationalization for property. Mm -hmm. and then the dividing up of the world into property. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to, you know, the vast majority of our history, 
we did not have private property or private pro property was your home or the, your tools. But mm -hmm. to, most of history, property was, was quite jointly used. Mm -hmm. and, and this is critically important because everything in nature is interconnected. So as an ecologist, we think, okay, everything's interconnected. But when you think property, you take nature and you divide it up and, and map it out and say, okay, and I own this and I can do whatever I want on it. Right. And that's central to the economic worldview. Mm -hmm. And then the economic worldview says, oh, wait a minute, there's some things that are external that sometimes um, something on my property will hit somebody in their property. Well, that's only external because we have this first idea that you can divide it up in the first place. Mm -hmm. Something happens across that boundary, but that boundary is in the mindset of mm -hmm. the modern Western mind. Mm -hmm. And modern Western people really thought Native Americans were primitive, even barbarian, yeah. because they used the land in common. Right. And that was so wasteful. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly true that by dividing up the property, we've been able to exploit it individually and enter this into the property system and mm -hmm. exploit it and mm -hmm. respond to property incentives. And the economy has boomed. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we've had all of the environmental problems of the last century. Right. And then only in the last few decades have the public begun to realize that we have climate change. Mm -hmm. And you know, and the really strange thing is, Arrhenius knew we had climate change right. years, years ago. But that global understanding that Arrhenius had uh, wasn't retained within science. Mm -hmm. It was a specialty within science that a few people followed, and especially picked up again in the 1950s, 60s when mm -hmm. we realized that carbon was increasing in the atmosphere. Right. But our scientific community was also fragmented. Yes. And so we were not seeing the whole system, even though Arrhenius, as a scientist, wrote on the whole system. Mm -hmm. So property and fragmentation, fragmentation of nature, fragmentation of knowledge, yeah. The idea of the market as being the system that links it all together and makes mm -hmm. it work right, except, oh, wait a minute, there's these external things that just happen to occur. Mm -hmm. And all those external things that just happen to occur, of course, just happen to be all the problems we have. Right. And, right. Then, and then, then there's external things on the social side as well. That mm -hmm. Society is not divisible into individuals that we think of society now as the sum of individual wants. Right, right. We try to balance those wants and meet those wants. But we don't think of society as a, as a social system, as a learning mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. as you mm -hmm. know, a justice system. Um, and so this dividing of property, dividing up of society, and then linking of them through the market is you know, the essence of the problem we have. Mm -hmm. So let me end by asking, um, what are you most hopeful about? Where do you see the bright spots? What makes you optimistic? You talk about intergenerational equity. What's your vision for, you know, the next seven generations, as they say? Uh, a, couple of, a couple of Junes ago, graduations ago, I gave a graduation talk for the Energy and Resources Group. It's called, it's called There's No Reason for Hope. Oh. And, <laughs> <laughs> and a reason doesn't need, or hope to, it doesn't need reason, or hope isn't oh, okay. on empirical evidence. Um, and I'm, I'm not optimistic, but I'm, ex I'm hopeful. If I weren't hopeful, I wouldn't be doing all of this. Um, where my hope comes is from the possibility that all the efforts to think more systemically, to work on the problems and then see that the problems are interconnected uh, will lead to a transformation. Mm -hmm. I don't 
have the vision of how this will happen, mm -hmm. but transformations have occurred in the past. Mm -hmm. And the whole development of capitalism was, you know, a major transformation. Mm -hmm. And we can have other transformations in the process. And capitalism itself has had several, mm -hmm. you know, many lives. Mm -hmm. Cat with nine lives, and it hopefully will be formed to some sort of a democratic capitalism. Mm -hmm. We begin to stress the linkages of society and nature mm -hmm. rather than liberty and freedom and individual choice and right. all that stuff. Right, so, right. With I'm, that, oh, go I'm ahead. Hopeful. I do see a lot more thinking towards a common good, but I, you know, I, I also look at what's going on and I can't be optimistic. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> I, I, I like um, I like the differentiation between optimism and hopefulness and um, thinking about the changes we have had and the changes that can happen. Speaking from the world of education, I know there's a huge push in teacher education in K-12 to try to you know, bridge these ways of thinking. Um, and so hopefully that will contribute to the next generation that can help make this shift.